I am back and I'm filming in the evening which is why I have this backdrop because the sun has been shining on the other side it will give me a really horrible video and I really need those special lights but I don't have any right now because they're too expensive and my channel isn't that successful <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you about food chains, food webs, ecosystems basically everything to do with those topics with the exception of the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle because I actually have other videos on that which you can watch here and hopefully there'll be a link there for you. So I'm going to discuss the differences between food chains, food webs, all the keywords like community, environment, habitat, consumers, producers, but for the main part this video will be made up of past exam questions because I think that's the easiest way of doing it. A lot of this topic is common sense and people that watch natural history shows will find it much easier. Um, and it might be a good way of breaking it with revision. Just watch a bit of David Attenborough and it will help you a bit with this whole topic. However, we're going to start with some key definitions. First of all, producers. Now these are plants which photosynthesize and you always find a producer at the beginning of a food chain. Next up we have consumers and these are organisms which feed on our plants. And lastly we have decomposers and what they do is they rot the dead material, the dead plants, the dead animals and they decay them. Now we need to do some really annoying definitions, things like environment. The environment is the sum total of all the non-living components. So to give this context, if you had a pond, the environment would be the water and the soil found in the pond. And if you had a forest, the environment would be the air and the soil. Next up we have habitat. The habitat is the place where specific organisms live, such as a pond or under a log. Population, now this is the total of all the individuals of a particular species found in an ecosystem. Community is the combined total of all the different populations of species living within a particular environment. And I think that's everything. Um, don't go crazy learning these definitions if you're really struggling. I mean, I would never bother to learn them. They're too similar, they're too confusing, and you'd still manage to get an A star without them. Um, really, only people that want to get like 100% should be troubling themselves with these because, I'm sorry, they're just really, really annoying. I'm now going to talk about a food chain. Remember, a food chain is just a way of showing what eats what. We call each stage of the food chain a trophic level, and it's just literally what I just said. A trophic level is a stage of a food chain. Food chains always start with producers and these tend to be green plants. The reason it starts with a producer is because a producer absorbs energy from the sun. So yes, food chains begin with producers. What eats a producer? Well, it's a consumer. Because it's the first consumer, we call it the primary consumer. Next up we have the secondary consumer, which eats the primary consumer. And then we have the tertiary consumer, which eats the, which eats the secondary consumer. We tend to not go any further than a tertiary consumer because basically most food chains only ever end up being about four organisms long because all the energy runs out and I'm going to touch on that very soon um, but all the energy runs out which means it's quite unlikely that you'll get a fifth organism or a quaternary consumer I mean it does happen sometimes but not very often let's again touch on a few other keywords herbivore, carnivore and omnivore remember herbivore just eats vegetation clearly a carnivore eats meat and an omnivore like us and pigs they eat both a mixture of vegetation and animal matter you will tend to find that the last organism in the food chain, which will tend to be the tertiary consumer, we call that the top carnivore. The reason being is that very rarely does it get eaten by something else. So something like a polar bear never has to worry about being eaten because it is the top carnivore in an arctic food chain. Sometimes when we're feeling jazzy, we like to arrange food chains in terms of pyramid of numbers. And pyramids of numbers are just a way of showing the exact numbers of each organism at each level of the food chain. So you'll find that the bottom tends to be the plant, so it could be the number of oak trees, the number of leaves, the number of grass blades, for example. And then the level above that will be something like a rabbit, which feeds on the grass. And then the level above that could be a fox, which eats the rabbit. And the thing is, we can't guarantee that the pyramid of numbers will indeed be pyramidal in shape. And that's because sometimes the individual numbers of the vegetation aren't always bigger than the rabbits, for example. And I'm actually going to explain what I mean by that. The point is, if you had an oak tree as the start of your food chain, there's only one oak tree. So actually the base of your pyramid would be really narrow um, in comparison to the number of, let's say, caterpillars feeding on it. So pyramid of numbers isn't actually a very good way of representing a food chain because you end up with some really strange shaped pyramids. Therefore, we choose to use a pyramid of biomass. A pyramid of biomass is the total mass of organisms of, at each trophic level, and it's irrespective of numbers. And it gives us a much better shape to our pyramid because based on mass, we always find that the producers have the largest mass, 
they have a larger mass than the primary consumers, the primary consumers have a larger mass than the secondary consumers. The reason being is that there are always more rabbits than foxes and the weight of an oak tree is always going to be bigger than the number of caterpillars or whatever feeding on it. So I hope that makes sense to you. We tend to use um, pyramids of biomass because they give a better representation of actually what's going on in our food chain. A question they always ask is, why doesn't all the energy inside the grass become part of the rabbit? So say grass is our producer, rabbit is our primary consumer. The reason being is this, because there's a huge amount of loss, energy loss between the grass and the rabbit, and it's actually approximately 90%. And the reason being is that first of all, the rabbit doesn't eat all of the grass. For example, it may not eat its roots. Second point is that the grass isn't entirely digestible, so some of it will pass straight through the rabbit and become its feces. Um, third of all, a lot of that energy will be used by the rabbit to move and also to keep it warm and for respiration etc. So you can't guarantee that all that grass actually transfers itself into the mass of the rabbit. So yeah, 90% of energy is lost to each level of the food chain in movement, in maintaining the body temperature of the animal and also in excretory losses like producing urine and urea or e egestion such as the production of faeces. So yeah, huge amounts of energy losses. The next thing I just wanted to touch on is if you have any predator-prey cycle questions. Remember that the prey numbers will always peak before the predator numbers, um, and that's because there's a time delay as the predator numbers can only peak when there's enough prey to feed on. And then as soon as the prey numbers drop, then you will see a secondary drop in the predator numbers, and that's because there's less food for them to feed on. I think it's about time that I started going through some questions because this is a topic which is better explained by looking at the type, types of questions they may ask you but I do hope you found it helpful and if you did please like it and tell your friends about my channel because I'm hoping to gain some more subscribers and that would be really nice so I'll see you very soon don't forget to leave me any topic requests below bye bye food chains show the flow of energy through the organisms in a habitat figure one shows the food chain grass being eaten by sheep which is eaten by the human remember the grass is the producer and everything else are consumers the biomass in each stage of the food chain changes as food passes along the food chain. Draw a pyramid of biomass for this food chain, label the pyramid. Okay, because it's a pyramid of biomass, it means that it will definitely be a pyramid shape, so it will be triangular. It's going to have three layers, and remember grass is the heaviest, has the most amount of biomass, so you're going to write grass on the bottom, sheep above it, and humans at the top, so that's a nice way to start. Good! Next up, table 1 shows three food chains, A, B and C. 1B part 1, in which food chain A, B or C will the greatest proportion of biomass and energy of the plants be passed to humans? Right, remember there's a huge amount of energy loss um, at each stage of the food chain, over 90% due to things like excretion, movement, um, keeping warm, etc. So you're looking here for the shortest food chain because it means that the most amount of energy will be passed on. So the shortest food chain we can see is C. 1B part 2, give reasons why the food chain that you chose in B part 1 passes on the greatest proportion of biomass and energy to humans. Okay, well I was kind of just talking about that. You want to say for your first mark that um, food chain C has the fewest number of stages or the fewest trophic levels. For your second mark you could therefore say there are less losses in terms of um, by excretion or the production of faeces. And for the third mark you can say there were fewer energy losses um, in respiration. So that's nice. Aphids are insect pests. They feed on broad bean plants. The aphids can be controlled by lacewing larvae. Use this information to draw a food chain in the space below. So we need to start with the producer, which is the broad bean plant. So that's going to start here. And then they get fed upon by the aphids. So we need to draw an arrow from the broad beans to the aphid. And then lastly, the well, they're eaten by lacewings. So they need to go at the top of the food chain here. How do you spell larvae? It's got a V in it. Perfect. A student wanted to compare the ability of two different species of predator, lacewings and hoverflies, to control aphids. Lacewings were released on day zero into one field of broad beans, field X, and the hoverflies were released into a different field of broad beans, field Y. The table shows his results. Don't panic when you see tables like this. You just need to have a good look at it and work out what's going on. So let's do that now. Remember, there are two fields and there are two lots of predators and they're both feeding on aphids. So we've got aphid numbers, which are around the 750 mark for both. And then they're being fed upon by the lacewings on the left-hand side of the table and hoverflies on the right-hand side of the table. Use information in the table to answer the following questions. 
okay, I've done the stupid thing again, but what you need to do here is suggest two reasons why lace wings might be better predators to use to control aphids than hoverflies. So let's look at the numbers so we can compare them. Right, if we look at the aphid number on the lace wing side, we can say that at day 18 they drop to zero, whereas on the hoverfly side they stay at 240. So the first thing you can say is that all aphids are eaten by the lace wings, therefore they are better predators. And then you can also look at the lace wing num numbers, and actually they massively grow in numbers, so they start at 22, but then they finish at 255. So you can make the second point, which is that the lace wings remain after all that time, whereas the hoverflies all die out, which isn't great, to be honest. Next up, suggest one reason why hoverflies might be better predators to use to control aphids than lace wings. Okay, let's look back at the numbers. Right, so if we look at... Um, what would be a good number to look at? Let's look at day three. If you look at day three, the lace wings have um, have meant that there are 770 aphids left, whereas the hoverflies mean that there are 740. Um, and then if we take another day, day 12 is a good example, there are 520 aphids left with, la with lace wings, but there are only two left with the hoverflies. So actually what you could say here is that the hoverflies cause a faster decrease in the numbers of aphids in the shortest amount of time. Other than predation, name two biotic living factors that may affect aphid numbers. I didn't actually mention biotic factors in my video just now. Just remember that these are factors which are caused by the living organisms all interacting with each other, um, which means you can ignore things like temperature and water availability and oxygen availability because they will be non-living abiotic factors. So in terms of living factors which may affect aphid numbers, you could say anything like disease, you could say the availability of their food, or you could say competition. So there's plenty of points to be made there. Um, and then part two, name two biotic non-living factors which may affect aphid numbers. Well, I just sort of mentioned that. The first thing is temperature. Um, the second thing you could say is the availability of water. And then um, the third thing you could have said is that um, the amount of sunlight will also affect aphid numbers. Now I have a slightly different sort of question which you may be asked, but I thought it would be good to show you. So question six, when trees lose leaves, they fall to the ground and form leaf litter. The leaf litter provides food for many animals. The diagram shows a food web that can, includes leaf litter. Okay, so we've got our tertiary consumers, which is this horrible wolf spider, the secondary consumers, which is a beetle larva, and the ground beetle. Primary consumers, whole selection of different organisms, and then leaf litter at the bottom. So use the information in the food web to complete the table. The first one has been done for you. The number of different tertiary consumers. It's always good to have a look and make sure you agree, so you can work out that you're in the same mindset for this um, question as the exam people want you to be. So the number of different tertiary consumers, one... Yeah, there's just the wolf spider there, so yes, I do agree with that, which is reassuring. Okay, the number of trophic levels. Remember, the trophic level is each stage of the food chain. So how many different stages do we have? Well, it's four, because you've got the leaf litter, um, which is the producers, the primary consumers, the secondary consumers, and the tertiary consumers, totaling four. Next up, the number of food chains. Right, this time you need to look at it from um, bottom to top and work out how many different chains there are. Well, the first chain is leaf litter snail, beetle larva, wolf spider. The second chain is leaf litter, wood louse, beetle larva, wolf spider. The third chain is leaf litter, earwig, ground beetle, wolf spider. And the fourth chain is leaf litter, millipede, ground beetle, wolf spider. So I've totaled that up and that is four food chains and I hope you see where I got that number from. The number of different predators. Right, remember predators are things which eat, or, um, they eat prey. So you can ignore the primary consumers because leaf litter is not a prey. So you're looking at this point at the secondary and the tertiary consumers. So the number of predators is three because it's the wolf spider, beetle larva and ground beetle. And then lastly, the number of different consumers. Okay, it's basically everything that eats anything, including the leaf litter. So the number of consumers is the snail, wood louse, earwig, millipede, beetle larva, ground beetle, wolf spider, and that totals seven. Thank you.